from the dark web to your radio dial. You are listening to CyberTalk Radio on News 1200 WOAI. Welcome to CyberTalk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20-year internet security veteran. I'm joined this week uh, by a couple of our wonderful military personnel here stationed in San Antonio. Uh, we're here this week uh, to talk about the Military Cyber Professionals Association of San Antonio and uh, what this uh, nonprofit organization is up to. So, uh, Sean and Charles, uh, thank you for uh, agreeing to join us this week and uh, come here on the air to talk about uh, what MCPA is going to uh, do for the city of San Antonio as this chapter uh, gets up and going here. Thanks. Thank you, yeah. Brett. So, uh, Sean, can you go and give a little bit of your background? How did you get involved in uh, the Air Force? And then uh, why uh, join and, and start working um, in your free time on the Military Cyber Professionals Association? Well, I was approached, hey, do you want to be treasurer of the Military Cyber Professional Association? And I didn't know much about it. And it got explained to me. And um, we sat down at the Lion and the Rose pub um, down here in downtown San Antonio with uh, a couple of uh, guys from uh, Ernst & Young. And uh, they were the president and the vice president. And they were like, hey, we need a treasurer. Do you want to do this? And I was like, sure. So I came on board as the treasurer, did some work with them. We decided to reinvent ourselves a little bit. And then ultimately I rolled into uh, being the president of the MCPA. Wonderful. And uh, how about you, Charles? So uh, I actually found MCPA when I was stationed in Germany. I, uh, I used to be a medic and kind of got tired of that, wanted something bigger and better. So I applied to cross-train into this uh, new cyber career field. The Air Force was standing up and didn't really know what I was getting into. So I found a guy who was in the career field already to shadow while I was shadowing him, he was like, hey, check this thing out. Apply online. They can help you out, you know, get you where you need to be. So that's where I got into it. And then uh, when I PCS'd to uh, Lackland Air Force Base, I met uh, Sean. And he leaned over to me and was like, hey, do you, what do you know about MCPA? Have you ever heard of them? And I was like, actually, I have. And then uh, from that point on, I was part of the MCPA here. Excellent. Yeah. So if you're out there and you're listening and you're thinking, well, maybe I want to be part of this Air Force uh, cyber stuff and you're not in the Air Force today. Uh, we had uh, Tech Sergeant Diami Baker on, who's the uh, Air Force cyber recruiter. Uh, you can listen to that on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com, uh, as well as on uh, iTunes podcasts or Pocket Casts or pretty much any podcast service that you uh Try to look us up on out there. Uh, you can learn uh, all about how the Air Force, uh, if you go through and uh, apply, uh, they'll send you to uh, training on all of this. So you don't even need to have cyber skills. You can just decide you want to serve uh, your country and you want to be uh, out there uh, in cyber. And if you go through, get accepted, they'll send you through to training uh, and potentially even uh, straight into the reserves, if you'd like. You uh, don't even necessarily have to go uh, straight active duty uh, beyond just that initial uh, boot camp and the training cycles. So you can learn more listening to uh, Tech Sergeant Baker talk all about that and uh, learn about the over 1,500 uh, openings. His, uh, cybersecurity is uh, hot inside the military. It's uh, hot out there in the private sector. There's hundreds of thousands to potentially millions of uh, openings. Um, and I'm talking about this right now to lead into a little bit of uh, some of the stuff that MCPA has been working on here in San Antonio over the uh, last month or so here leading up to uh, them joining us on the air today. They've been uh, working on a camp uh, for 13 to 17 year old kids. Uh, can you guys, uh, one of you who's uh, working on that one and share a little bit more about uh, what that camp's going on and uh, how folks can look up and learn more about it? Well, if you go to the MCPA website, millcyber.org, and you look at the vision, it says professional networking in STEM. And as the San Antonio chapter, Charles and I looked at each other and we said, how are we going to promote STEM in San Antonio? So immediately we picked up a program called Coder Dojo, and that was a great success. Um, get instructors to teach uh, computer coding. Whatever language they're proficient in, we get them to pick it up, get them a curriculum, and start teaching kids. Uh, as it started getting bigger, we decided, hey, let's throw some more, some more topics in here. Um, 
maybe do cybersecurity, maybe do computer networking, maybe do robotics. So we had um, the coding and the robotics. And the kids liked the robotics a lot too. We literally had them making remote control cars that had sensors on them. And as they drove up to the wall, they would stop, reverse, and turn around while using C++ coding to interface and send commands to uh, Arduino boards so they could control those cars. And that was a big hit. Those kids liked it a lot. And then we um, started the cybersecurity stuff and we called it Ghostwire. So we thought it was a cool name. Just thought kids would think it was awesome. Yeah. That's and they, step one is name it a, something cool so kids get excited about it. Yep. And so um, we started the uh, Ghostwire and it's a hit too. They like coming down, hearing about malware and behavioral characteristics of malware and, you know, how to fix grandma's computer. I think uh, one of the favorite things the kids seem to like is uh, social engineering. We uh, go through exercises with them on that and they uh, they get to play both sides of it. So that's always fun for them. Yeah, that's uh, good things uh, for kids to get trained on uh, because the ones that are not getting that cyber security awareness training uh, through a program like Ghostwire or else are... Um, often ones that are out there on the internet they get taken advantage of they get tricked or duped by these sites uh, you'll get a, a pop-up ad that says your computer's infected click here to save yourself and that's really a, a technical version of social engineering you're not talking to somebody on the phone but your computer's not infected until you do click on the pop-up and then Absolutely. you've actually caused yourself a problem where you thought you were fixing it and it's designed for those kind of seven to ten year old kids that can read uh, but don't yet have that social um, engineering and security awareness training to know that's actually a hacker out there after you. Yeah, and you see that a lot too with these kids uh, clicking on things because they don't, you know, they don't have the, the awareness to realize what's going on. So if they're watching video game YouTube ads or, or something of that nature, they'll just click all over everything. If you can teach kids not to do those things, then you know, obviously, yeah, we we make these things uh, much safer. So the yeah, social engineering aspect, fun. I saw in some of the curriculum, it looks like you uh, guys uh, get the uh, Wireshark and show them how to set that stuff up as well. Oh, yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah, for, for our listeners out there that don't know what Wireshark, I got some excited smiling nods in here because you can have a, a good amount of fun with that, especially the like kids again. This is, It um, lets them go and, and do some pretty cool things on networks. So can you share a little bit about uh, Wireshark and why that's fun for the kids? So uh, basically what Wireshark is is it allows you to see all the traffic going on the network, uh, all the all the packets of data. So you can pick all those data packets apart and see what they are, see what's in them. A lot of stuff that goes across the internet is what we call it in clear text. So any Joe Schmo who has a packet sniffer like Wireshark can read it. And so what we do exercises with the kids, we'll throw passwords and stuff in clear text and tell them, hey, you know, go to this website and... As they're going to the website, we have other kids set up with traffic sniffers on their laptops. So they're sniffing each other's traffic. And it's like, okay, you know, we created a username and login for you. Go ahead and log in. And they, they do that and they see it. And it's it's real cool for them. And, you know, they, they're excited because they feel like, you know, they're, they're doing hacker stuff. But in reality, they're also getting the experience where they're seeing, hey, you know, if I'm out on, at Starbucks, yeah. you know, anybody could steal my password. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a good one um, to talk to folks about. It's why you should uh, always use uh, the secure websites. It's that little S at the end of the HTTP um, there in your web browser. Some of them make the bar green. Some of them put a little padlock up there. But uh, you should be going to websites these days. Uh, everything should be HTTPS because um, not only can those hackers use something like Wireshark to uh, sniff your traffic, but there's other tools called packet injectors to where if you go to one HTTP website, somebody in the network can potentially rewrite that session for you and inject traffic that didn't come from really the website. It might have come from that hacker's computer sitting on the Wi-Fi network there with you. Yeah, we, we like to take the approach that we're not really teaching uh, kids how to sniff traffic in the public libraries to get um, credentials and, and use them. We kind of showcase to um, teach about password complexity, how not yeah. to make... Uh, a super simple password that could easily be cracked that you need to put special characters and stuff and follow those policies. And and that's really important because they see that and then they start to realize that, hey, maybe I shouldn't make my password Cassie, which is the name of their dog or something like that. Yeah. We, ha we had some problems too, like uh, trying to showcase these examples because a lot of sites are out there are now HTTPS. Like we really had to hunt around and find one where we could find a field where we could 
generate a username and password that wasn't HTTPS, which is really fantastic. It's wonderful. But it was def difficult for the example we were trying to show. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. And yes, yeah, so if you're a developer out there and you have any forms or fields on your website, um, you're taking any user-generated content input, please, HTTPS. But uh, I mean, really, even if you're just serving up static content, uh, on the site, HTTPS. Uh, like, you'll go to CyberTalk Radio, and could we serve that main page that just has uh, the information about the show on it without HTTPS? Um, sure, but uh, we're using Let's Encrypt, which is a free SSL certificate service. Uh, so go, you can go to letsencrypt.org. So there's not even a... It's too expensive to make my website secure these days. It's free. Uh, literally doesn't cost you anything more than a little bit of time at letsencrypt.org to uh, secure that traffic out there and keep the website safe. With the uh, the program you've got going with the, the kids, you mentioned the uh, library. So you're running this um, at the San Antonio Public Library? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Historically, we um, go around and get any library that will let us sit in there and teach. Usually there's not much resistance, but where we do get resistance is for the voting polls and stuff like that. So sometimes we get kicked out of the way. Because, you know, it's first come, first serve. So, yeah. and, and that's fair. But um, so a lot of the libraries here see us as a, a priority and a need and not just a want. Because we're providing a public service that's important, that, um, that people realize that we're doing this for a reason, not just to um, be good Samaritans or, or some of that nature. Yeah. No, I mean, this is uh, one of the things that I think that makes San Antonio kind of truly a special place is that um, there are chapters of the MCPA and kids have the opportunity to go learn cybersecurity here um, through this or through uh, a number of different programs. We have um, almost as many cyber patriot teams even as a lot, the city of Los Angeles. They're number one. But, I mean, and they're um, maybe three or four times the size of San Antonio. Uh, so kids get a, a lot of opportunity here to learn cybersecurity. And, and with programs like this, maybe if they aren't on a cyber patriot team now, they can go there they can learn some things and, and get to where they uh, are able to join uh, one the following season right. yeah we try to make this one we do make it 100 percent free for anybody who wants to sign up if a kid has um, some ambition to want to learn about computers or cybersecurity or coding or robotics we really try to nurture that and grow that out in an individual because you know it's they're going to be the ones defending our networks in the future so if you start them while they're young and build them up there'll be better cyber defenders in, in, in the coming years. Yeah. The other thing that I've recently learned, uh, they're sharing what we teach them with their parents. I met one of the parents in one of the previous classes, and uh, the mom was like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, I was on the computer, and I, w I went to do this thing, and, you know, my son come up and stopped me. And uh, so I, I think that's another another big benefit of it. You're listening to Cyber Talk Radio on 1200 WAI. We're talking about the Military Cyber Professional Association. If you uh, missed the start of the program and just uh, turned on your radio right now, uh, you can listen to a rebroadcast or replay of this on Tuesday. Uh, it'll be up online on our website at www.cybertalkradio.com. Uh, you can also uh, like us on Facebook or follow us on Twitter uh, and see uh, when information about programs gets posted uh, or events that we're having uh, around the uh, San Antonio area. We may even plan on taking a, a trip uh up and meeting with some guests in the Austin area soon. So if you are are from Austin and interested in being on the program, uh, you can uh, go on our website and let us know that you would like to be a, a guest of the show. So, uh, Charles, we were talking uh, Military Cyber Professional Association. Uh, for those that, that have just joined us here now on the radio, uh, can you give us a little background on uh, what's the, the number one thing uh, from a mission for uh, MCPA, the goal of the organization? So the organization's goal is uh, mentorship and development of our uh, nation's military cyber forces, and then also STEM outreach. And so we, we fulfill that. We do uh, like quarterly talks. We'll invite a guest speaker from the community. Usually we, we've had guys from Semantic, uh, cyber guys from USAA, uh, industry leaders have had them come out and talk to our military guys and then we also have our stem programs where we do our outreach into the community yeah and so there's a san antonio chapter of this but this is a nationwide organization or global yeah that's correct yeah so uh going back for the the history of the organization uh when did it uh, get started and what was the the genesis of that beginning 
So I think it all started back in about 2010, 2011 with uh, Joe Billingsley. And uh, my takeaway from it was that, hey, you know, there's a, a National Association for Submarines. There's a National Association for Radio. There's a National Association for this and that. And uh, Joe Billingsley took his vision and said, I want to make a National Association for Military Cyber Professionals. And that's how that got started up. So, yeah, as this becomes one of the growing career fields uh, in our military, it makes sense for uh, you to be able to stay together and then as a, an organized group uh, be able to uh, give back to the cities that you're stationed in. Right. Absolutely. And um, we're, we're starting to work on a new project because we're really trying to hone in this uh, professional development because it's great to have public speakers and everybody come and hear what they have to say because they say some amazing things. Um, we, they, we've noticed that people really like uh, the tech talks too. People come down, they want to hear nerdy things. They want to hear technical details about uh, malware or, or the recent hack or, or, or whatever's going on in the industry at the time. But what we want to do is make a, a new program, an offensive cyber range, where we're going to bring people together to come in that are MCPA members and work collaboratively to solve problems. So, for example, you know, if, you, if your background is clearly just, you know, cyber defense, but you've always wanted to do offense, we can come down and create that environment and we can test offensive skills just for fun. And, and that's a really fantastic professional networking opportunity because as we invite people that come down, you know, hey, I'm working on this hack with this person from Route 9B. Hey, I'm working on this hack with this person from USA and I'm working on this hack from somebody else in, a, in another uh, business. As they work together, you know, that's that's a personal resume. So when that person wants to transition out of the military, you know, people are going to say, hey, I know that guy because we worked on a, a RSA encryption uh, problem or we worked on this and we worked on that. Yeah. So that idea is to bring people together to work together on these problems and, and, and that will make the professional network happen because I think that's a lot more important than just having a resume, um, that face-to-face -face interaction and that handshake and working together on problems like that, it's, it's a, it feels like a no-brainer to me. Yeah, and as, as you're talking there, uh, one of the, the things we've uh, had some conversations uh, with others in the program about is there's transitioning out of the military is uh, tricky for some folks because uh, for a couple of different reasons, you do a, a bunch of uh, internal certifications uh, where you get training, and uh, but they're not recognized industry certifications necessarily. And then the second is there's a lot of blank spots on y'all's resume. Right. Like, right. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. I a little was, bit. I was stationed in San Antonio and I worked with computers. You're like, well, what else did you do with these computers? Oh, I sat at the keyboard and I typed on things. So, right. yeah, with, with that piece, it makes it tricky for folks to even go through and get an interview because their resume gets sent in and, and the robots, um, I call them robots, but they're really just poor keyword search machines, don't match up and, and flag anything so that you even get a call back to find out, hey, wow, these people really do know their stuff and they've been working on this for years and they are experts. So. Right. You know, for um, transitioning members that are having a hard time um, realizing what their capability is, um, if you go to the millcyber.org website, um, Adam Tyra made a, uh, a post about what to say in your resume. A lot of military members put, hey, you know, I deployed here, a lot of military buzzwords. And as they go to put their resume forward, it doesn't translate in the uh, business industry. Yeah. So he uh, laid out a good way for um, somebody like you or, or me or, or Charles to uh, make that connection and, and tailor their resume more towards being in the uh, private sector. Not having to uh, get dressed in a uniform every morning. Correct. Right. Yes, yep. that sector. So if I was a, I'm a military cyber professional, either uh, active duty uh, now or in the reserves or uh, I've uh, discharged or retired, um, how do I get involved in MCPA? If so, I on, on the uh, millcyber.org website, you can just go on, apply, and then they'll have a spot where you can submit your DD-214 to them. Um, if you're not military, not a vet, and uh, not a government employee, and you want to still be involved, uh, they do charge a membership fee. But for uh, government employees, military members, vets, it's free. That's excellent. So then in the San Antonio chapter here, um, you said the organization started back in 2010, 2011. Uh, overall, when did the San Antonio chapter stand up? I would say the San Antonio chapter started up in 2014. And then we just, uh, at first we came together and it was just a, a lot of meet and greets. And then we decided, hey, we got to push forward. We got to um, 
give something new to San Antonio. And that's how we led into all these programs. Yeah. So we talked a little bit uh, earlier in the program about the uh, boot camp you guys have going on for kids right now, the Ghost Recon. No, it's not Ghost Recon. That's Ghost the Wire. game. Ghost Wire. Ghost yeah. Wire. Ghost <laughs> Recon's a game the kids play, right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so the the Ghost Wire, the boot camp for kids, uh, what uh, are some other programs for uh, that you've done out there in the STEM education? Uh, you said that there's been things going back through the years uh, before this Ghost Wire stuff happened and now, right? So we, uh, we also have Coder Dojo. Um, that was our first program that we picked up, um, which we just pair programmers, people that know how to code up with kids. Uh, we provide them a curriculum uh, in whatever language they know, and then they, they teach the kids. So big brothers, big sisters, but instead of kind of how to get through school and make a day, the, you uh, are learning not just life skills, you're learning coding skills here. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. And That's not just coding skills, but also with a, a concentration on cybersecurity. So we'll stop and tell them, hey, look, you have to pay attention to your code because if you write code with vulnerabilities and you're working for a power plant, somebody could potentially use your code to exploit that software and bring down that power plant. So we tie that in for them. Yeah, and uh, he's not joking when he says power plants can go offline. Uh, there's uh, one in the Ukraine uh, earlier this year uh, went down. About 250,000 folks were out of power for uh, four hours, uh, maybe eight hours uh, a little bit rough the data coming back out of that one if you did want to hear more about those industrial control systems and hacking on that uh, you can listen to the replay or rebroadcast of cyber talk radio on our website uh, on youtube uh, or on itunes podcast and pocket cast uh, look up uh, industrial control systems or ics security and uh, we've got an episode there where we went into uh, some in-depth detail uh, that's one where uh, you listen to that and, and think, man, yeah, it's important that we're going to teach these kids uh, to grow up and be safe and secure coders because uh, I mean, we're seeing a little bit of, of what this looks like now with the natural disasters from the hurricanes where like Puerto Rico may not have power for seven months uh, and you would now have an uninhabitable uh, island or big section of the island, which is uh, kind of terrible that like this can happen via natural disaster. Potentially, if you take an electricity plant offline, this can happen via a cyber attack and a hack as well and the electricity has gone for a while then the water plant can't operate and then if you don't have electricity and you don't have water uh, it gets to be very difficult to have a city and to have uh, order so keeping these industrial control systems safe is uh, important and there's lots of good people there working on security but um, as the uh, drawback in this whole thing it only takes one hole to get in and it takes the defenders have to block every single one of them so uh, I, I like that you uh, brought that up. Uh, that's for me personally. That's why this is so important. Uh, I refer to it as Cyber 9-11. So I'd rather see America ready for Cyber 9-11 before it happens as opposed to be hit with a massive attack that takes out our infrastructure and be caught with our pants down. So we're getting ready to uh, take a break here at the bottom of the hour for news, traffic, and weather. If you've uh, just joined in, uh, you're listening to Cyber Talk Radio on 1200 WAI. Uh, I'm your host, Brett Pyatt. I'm joined uh, by Sean and Charles, uh, two of our Air Force cyber professionals here in San Antonio and uh, members of the Military Cyber Professionals Association uh, here in San Antonio, helping uh, military professionals uh, work together and uh, help kids learn um, cybersecurity and uh, other STEM education, uh, robotics, and uh, computer programming, uh, or to help those military professionals uh, transition uh, to the private sector uh, after they uh, end their active duty with the military. Uh, so some great programs. We're going to uh, go into some more detail about this one. We will see uh, about how you get a black belt in Ghostwire and how that program's evolving. Uh, this is with kids and education. you got to make it fun. you got to set some goals. you got to make it entertaining and interesting for them. And then all of a sudden you will see uh, they can learn more than you ever imagined. So uh, hang with us here through uh, news, traffic, and weather update at the bottom of the hour. And we will be right back on Cyber Talk Radio.
Welcome back to Cyber Talk Radio. I'm your host, Brett Pyatt, a 20 year internet security veteran. If you're just uh, joining us after the news, traffic, and weather update here at the bottom of the hour, I'm joined this week by Sean and Charles, uh, two uh, members of the U.S. Air Force uh, that are also members of the Military Cyber Professionals Association of San Antonio. It's a nonprofit organization here uh, that helps uh, military cyber members uh, network, uh, learn how to translate their skills. Um, to the private sector, uh, work and collaborate with uh, private sector companies uh, in their areas on cyber projects. Uh, they also do a, a whole bunch around uh, STEM education uh, to uh, help us get more folks uh, involved in cybersecurity. This is a frequent uh, topic on this program because um, I could talk all sorts of uh, advanced cybersecurity uh, kung fu, but uh, if we talk all that kung fu and there's no one out there that knows how to actually go do anything with it, it doesn't matter. So we have hundreds of thousands of cybersecurity jobs posted today. Um, and I'm really, my belief is that there's probably over a million job openings. It's just uh, many companies are so discouraged they uh, don't even bother posting one because they know if they do, they're not going to get qualified applicants. So I'd like to thank both of you for uh, doing uh, what you can to uh, help out. Um, and get these uh, kids learning cybersecurity, excited about it, so this uh, next generation we can fill all of these jobs because uh, the world is uh, going uh, online uh, much more uh, every day. Uh, we're seeing uh, attacks um, on healthcare data information companies. Uh, they, one of the big credit uh, reporting firms, uh, Experian, uh, had a uh, very bad data breach uh, and attack here. Um, and this is uh, across all these areas. These companies that uh, have money to spend, they have a they had a chief information security officer. Some companies don't even have one of those, and they had one. They had a team, and even in all of those cases, these systems are big, they're complicated, and processes are complicated, and you don't really have all the training you need in every spot uh, across there. Like we said before the break, it only takes attackers one way to get in. You've got to stop it every single time. Guys, as I, I mentioned, uh, that Kung Fu, we had talked a little bit about uh, Ghost Wire uh, before for the break and you mentioned kids are going to get belts so uh our current model with coder dojo they get little usb belts and then as they go through courses they get different colored belts uh what we're actually moving to is we're moving away from the belts to make it more aligned with uh ghost wire in itself because we're rolling all of our programs under ghost wire so they're going to get lanyards and then as they complete courses they're going to get pins that correlate with the courses they've completed so you know kind of like the boy scouts or the girl scouts you know with their sashes so they'll show up you know and be like oh look i have a pin for you know c plus plus and c sharp and then someone else, oh i have java you know and so i think that'll be uh, cool for them because it can it's how they can showcase their expertise as opposed to just you know a usb bracelet yeah. Yeah. And that Ghostwire, uh, we're going to call it Ghostwire Academy. It's still going to follow the belt system that we uh, were following with Coder Dojo. So, for example, as we bring these kids in and we're trying to get them exposed to cybersecurity and computer hardening and OS hardening, uh, we divided it up into uh, uh, 10 week courses and then each one represents a belt level. So, um, if you're a noob, if you're new, <laughs> if you're a, uh, if you're a new guy and you're trying to learn cybersecurity, then we'll put you in the white belt course. And then um, as you get past that and we do a little CTF, then, hey, I'm ready for the, uh, the yellow belt course. And all that academia builds on top of each other. So some of the things we learn in the white belt course, hey, you know, this is how um, malware likes to behave. You know, we got these pop-ups. We know that, hey, we probably really shouldn't be clicking on the, um, the fake antivirus ad that pops up. You know, the, the kids will go through that academia and come to that understanding. And now we're going to put them in the yellow belt class and they're going to start to do more advanced things like, hey, let's really take a look at this uh, wire shark that we were working with. And let's try to carve out some of the things that we sniffed on the traffic that we were looking at in the public library, so forth and so on. So it's meant to evolve kids to a greater understanding of cybersecurity and computer coding and the robotics and the um, computer networking to make them um, more robust as adults, um, as these kids go through the academia and they, and they learn these things, you know, it, it creates a, a more aware cybersecurity professional. You know, if, if, if you take a cybersecurity professional today and he's just been through the uh, academia, he or she will still be able to recognize um, some of these vulnerabilities that exist. But if you have a kid that's learned it all of his life, he'll be more um, able to pick up on it sooner. 
And so that's what we're trying to create that, that sharpened strength. Yeah. I just, I had an epiphany the other day with this, uh, the big Apple announcement here recently, the, the iPhone X that it's, it's been 10 years of iPhone. So there's a whole generation of kids out there that n never knew that you actually had key physical keyboards on phones. Like all they've ever seen are these touchscreen things. So, and most, uh, I mean, everybody that's uh, under the age of 18 right now does not know the world pre-internet. They're like, what do you mean there wasn't an internet? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I mean, so for many of us listening out here, like there's still that the life before the Internet and now this life with the Internet. And we've seen all that change. But uh, for these uh, kids growing up, if they can learn all this stuff, these digital natives uh, will be able to uh, just know uh, instinctively um, how to keep themselves safe online. And as they move into the workforce, how to help keep uh, their either country if they choose to uh, join our armed forces or their uh, company safe if they choose to go in, into the private sector in the cybersecurity world. Uh, so I mean, we've been talking about some of this training and the, the aspects that makes a cybersecurity professional. And um, being that we're here uh, on the air in Texas, if you're listening to us on iHeartRadio outside of Texas, I'm going to use a, a gun safety uh, example because um, we're broadcasting from 1200 WAI here um, in San Antonio, right in the heart, in the middle of uh, the state of Texas. So uh, we can almost drive 600 miles in any direction. And we're still uh, in the state of Texas, or at least it feels that way. Maybe it's not 600 miles to the Louisiana border, but it might as well be through Houston traffic. So uh, with guns, uh, most uh, families here in Texas uh, have a firearm, um, and they kids, uh, as they're growing up, uh, learn to be around guns, uh, to learn um, how you have the safety on there, how they're appropriately locked and stored away, um, how you make sure that they uh, are not loaded when they are stored. Uh, all of those safety aspects around firearms so that you can use them responsibly, whether you're going out to a, a range to shoot skeet or whether you're uh, going out to a, a ranch to go uh, hunting um, or whether you're uh, keeping that weapon in the house uh, for uh, personal uh, family safety. Uh, all of those uh, aspects, you've got uh, safety and ethics training around that, that gun. So uh, you could choose to use that firearm for um, acts that you're not allowed to do. You could decide when you're out there hunting to shoot something you don't have a tag to, to go hunt. Ethically, maybe you get caught on that hunt. Maybe you don't. It's kind of this gray area and like maybe some kids try it and they get away with it or uh, their parents go, you know what, I'm just not going to turn them in for that. Um, and you get out there and, and if they you had a bunch of kids that were not supervised uh, by adults, um, they're going to be more likely um, because kids just have not learned at the depth level and they don't have the long term thinking to be able to understand the ramifications of their actions. So uh, if you've got kids that are curious and learning and already into computers, um, if they're out there on the Internet reading this stuff, uh, really getting into a program um, like Ghostwire where they're going to be around. Uh, trained uh, adults that have expertise in here and can have the ethics conversations with them and show them uh, not only uh, how to learn these things, but how to be responsible with it and some of the ramifications of their actions if they uh, were to choose to use the, the knowledge that they learn in a way that's not appropriate. So uh, I know that uh, ethics is something that you guys hit on in the the program and teach these kids the activities of what they're doing and, and how this stuff needs to be used really on the, the defensive side and the awareness side. Uh, so I appreciate you guys doing that and trying to get uh, as many of the kids through this as possible because it, it's not difficult to go out there on the internet. Um, if you're a parent and you're listening to this and you're like, well, my kids can't find hacking tools on the internet. Oh, yeah. Go to Google the search can. engine <laughs> and type in hacking tools right. download. And, well, click on some of the links. May or may not be the best idea because you may be getting yourself exploited there. If you don't have the knowledge and expertise, but um, if you click around for a little bit, there's packages out there, whether it's uh, – well-known, well-published things like Metasploit uh, or many of these others, uh, there's ways for um, folks to uh, easily get their hands on uh, tools now uh, that they they don't have the appropriate training and understanding of what they're doing. Um, they may even cause harm without meaning to because, again, you're using these tools and maybe you thought you were just scanning a network and, and looking at something, or you thought you were scanning your home network and you didn't really know how to use it very well and you were actually scanning somebody else's network. Uh, or then you thought you were just looking at things, but then you actually realized you ran the exploit and blue screened your computer. So 
um, is getting in and getting training to uh, learn how these things work uh, is important so they can be learned and used responsibly because uh, as uh, we talk about the cybersecurity and this cyber warfare, um, this is where weapons are moving. They're moving from guns and bombs to uh, exploits and digital uh, activity. So um, these things are dangerous just like the other ones. As uh, we are talking off the air during the break, as I mentioned, industrial control system hack in the Ukraine and one of the hospitals there went offline and like in that hospital, people died from a cyber attack. So uh, was it not a physical bomb dropped in the hospital? No, but it was a cyber bomb effectively that got dropped on that city in the Ukraine. Um, that cost people lives. So these cybersecurity skills and, and knowledge, uh, if not used responsibly and ethically, uh, can cause harm. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, in, in the same capacity that a child will go out and want to shoot with his father's gun, you know, his father will teach him all those ethics about holding a weapon and, and aiming and, and firing appropriately. You know, we run the we run the kids through those ethics as well. You know, kids aren't going out to do things bad on the internet. Any kid that has inspiration or an inclination to learn about electronics or computers is naturally going to reach out to the internet because that's where all the information is. So as they're doing that, you know, they're going to learn about buffer overflows. They're going to learn about SQL injections. They're going to learn about a lot of these common ways that websites can get hacked. And, um, you know, because it's all over the place. It's on yeah. YouTube. They, 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 they can look wherever they, can they want. Go to sans.org. There's yeah, a top sans- 10 list. Absolutely. Like, here's the 10 things to try first. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, more importantly, so they're probably going to turn to YouTube. And I don't know if you've ever gone through YouTube and looked the way a child would look. But a lot of the uh, kids that are up there posting, they're not posting correct information. They're posting what they themselves have derived from things that they've read. And so, you know, you're getting like third and fourth effect YouTube videos of misinformation. Yeah, as you know, those kids, they they go out and they reach out and they try to get information and, and, you know, they like, hey, I want to try this exploit because I have a tutorial that I can see online that's easy to follow. And they don't fully understand the consequences of what you're doing, like what you're highlighting about with the uh, with the uh, enumeration and and end map scanning and, and stuff of that nature, going out and trying to scan networks. You know, when they're in the Ghostwire class, we always put it on a concentration, uh, concentration on ethics. And, and we explain to them, hey, look, some of these things that you're doing, they can cause damage. Not just like immediately, but eventually or from another action that could occur. If you go out and you scan this network and it, and it um, misfires or, or malfunctions, you know, that could be something that could possibly put somebody's life in danger. So, you know, hacking is cool and fun and, and, and it's it's fun to watch and it's fun to hear about and stuff. But when we concentrate on the ethics of what you're doing and, and, and why you need to learn to be a white hat instead of a black hat. I think that carries a lot of weight with kids and it gives them a sense of uh, uh, pride and responsibility in what they're doing. Yeah. I think if kids grow up, they want to be superheroes, not super villains. Absolutely. Yes. So we can show them the path to being cyber superheroes. And you know, I've had some kids in class where they're like, <laughs> I think it would be awesome to be a, 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 a super villain. And, and, you know, I kind of explained to them, I'm like, well, you know, that does sound exciting and fun, you know, but there are a number of cybersecurity experts that have plenty of time to pick apart what you did, how you did it, and how to prove it was you. And you may outsmart four or five people for a, a limited amount of time, but eventually you're going to get caught and exposed and FBI is knocking on your door trying to figure out why little Jimmy tried to hack into the NSA or the, 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 the NASA website, you know, and it's, it's probably purely innocent, just a test concept, but you know, for those companies, that's a big deal. Yeah, no, yeah. If you take that uh, scanning software and start going after uh, your favorite .dot mil or .dot gov websites, yeah, you know, someone gonna, will come knock on your door. <laughs> it's going to yeah. cost some attention. You're listening to Cyber Talk Radio on 1200 WAI. Uh, if you're uh, joining us uh, on the replay uh, via our website, YouTube, iTunes, podcast, or Pocket Cast, thank you for listening in, and uh, thank you for uh, putting up with us uh, as I talk to our listeners that are uh, out there on the air um, and circle back on things. Because if you wanted to circle back on a, a topic, you can always hit rewind or go back at the little slider bar in your browser there. Uh, but uh, for those that may be in their car and uh, just joined the program, uh, we're talking Military Cyber Professionals Association of San Antonio here. 
about uh, how the uh, military members, if you're uh, stationed here and uh, want to get involved in a professional organization uh, to work on your skills, um, to collaborate with uh, some private sector partners or to take some of those skills and uh, help teach kids uh, STEM and cyber, uh, you can uh, get uh, involved and uh, check it out searching for MCPA San Antonio in your uh, Google or Bing or DuckDuckGo, depending on uh, <laughs> how you uh, like to obscure your searches on the Internet. Uh, so uh, you guys have a, an annual uh, event uh, that you do for uh, Capture the Flag that I'd heard a little bit about. Absolutely. Yeah, so what's the story on that one? So last year was our first year doing it, um, and we were just looking for a way to raise money uh, because what we do, we provide these services to the community for free, um, and then Sean and myself were both active duty, so we don't have a lot of free time to go out and, you know, make money other ways for the, uh, for the nonprofit so we decided to hold a CTF to try to raise funds to pay for, you know, all the all the bracelets and T-shirts and, you know, whatever else the kids might need for uh, during the courses. So we decided uh, to host the CTF. We had some, some sponsors. Uh, Hack5 gave us some goodies to give away. USAA gave us some money. Uh, Geekdom let us use their uh, event center over here. And, uh, yeah, it was it was a great time. We had, uh, I think, like 25 teams total. Uh there's only like 18 people uh, in the actual event center, and then we had a, a number of the teams were remote. No one actually finished the whole CTF, um, courtesy of Paul Jordan. He uh, he wrote that CTF, and uh, it was pretty legit. Good. Yeah, I like it. And uh, so uh, for those that are um, listening and normally thinking for uh, nonprofits, there's this uh, gala fundraiser you're getting on a tuxedo. This is a, a much more fun and practical hands-on fundraising uh, activity. Yeah. So um, explain what a Capture the Flag is for a listener that uh, has never participated in one before. So basically, the, uh, the teams or individuals, uh, I think everyone decided to be teams, they go through and they get points for whatever questions they can answer. So it'll be basically computer-based puzzles. Um, some of them may be set up where you have to actually break into a box, find the flag on the box, and others are going to be you have an encryption algorithm and you have to figure out how to crack it. Um, so there's a lot of different variation in what we did there. Yeah, so logic games and puzzles to figure out how to get through to uh, some piece of information that's stored uh, either on a USB stick or on a server somewhere right. or on a website or right. uh, depends on the, the different uh, CTF and then what the, the objectives are in that one. But this is uh, where you learn how to, to go through all the, the different pieces of the computing systems to uh, get through and peel back the layers of the onion until you reach the information. It sounds like on this one, uh, the uh, objective was not found. So no one... No one made it all the way through. Did you have a winning team that got the closest? We did. Yeah. We did. I, I think they were... They it was uh, QWERTY. Q-W-E-R-T-Y. Yeah. That, that and was they a, got pretty far. Yeah. I think they had one or two flags left to find. Yeah. They almost made it. They oh, we, we made it pretty difficult. Like, you know, we're not going to say, hey, all you cyber guys that are so experienced come down and come to our CTF and they just blast right through it. No, we wanted to make it pretty hard and difficult for them to get progress. And uh, it worked. So yeah, th thanks cool. Paul Jordan because he pulled that off great. <laughs> yeah, so uh, and QWERTY, Q W E R T Y. It sounds like a complicated password. It's not one you should use. <laughs> if you have never looked down at your keyboard, it's the characters up at the top left. Uh, so as we we had talked a little bit about the start of the program about uh, better passwords, um, teaching kids to use good passwords. Kids will do stuff like QWERTY or, as mentioned earlier, their dog's name or maybe whatever their favorite video game character's name is. Uh, so these are things that should not be passwords. Um, and you, this is uh, one for the parents listening out there as well, or just business professionals. Um, if you think you're getting communication from a trusted colleague or you're getting communication from one of your children, it may or may not be uh, your colleague or your children if they're not using good passwords and keeping their system safe and secure. So um, if you're getting asked to share sensitive information, um, via a text message or a online chat or an email, um, pick up the phone and call them over voice. It's much harder to spoof that. It's not impossible these days. Um, I know some folks out there, as we were mentioning YouTube, there's a video of uh, President Obama that was not President Obama. 
Um, so, that, I mean, they've even faked a whole video there. He was not president at the time when this video was fake, but just to show where the state of that, that has come through. But for the average person, if you pick up the phone and call and do a voice authentication, did you really send me this email? That's pretty good. The ideal is if you don't have to share sensitive information um, over an online connection without verifying in person first that, that they asked you for it. Um, just wait until you actually see them face to face because uh, we're a long ways away from uh, being able to uh, fake that. So uh, as you guys uh, did the CTF event last year, if the folks wanted to learn about when this next one is or if they wanted to volunteer to try to help uh, set it up and uh, work the event next year, uh, where do they find out about that from you all? So our, our website would be the best best place to go, um, mcpatacsa.org. Um, we're also having a, a social event coming up on uh, October 21st at the Anchor Bar. Um, Going to be discounted wings there. Uh, come, sip beer, interact with us. We're always looking for uh, volunteers that know how to code and don't mind teaching kids. I know plenty of programmers, but the minute they find out that I'm wanting them to teach kids, they're like, eh. Yeah. So this is a, a basically it's a big brothers and big sisters, but instead of teaching them life skills, you're going to teach them software development. So if that sounds uh, engaging for you, you want to help some kids learn to code. Uh, what time are you all going to be out at the Anchor Bar? So we're going to get there. It uh, starts at 4 p.m. and it's going to last until 7 p.m. So there you go. And uh, where's this uh, Anchor Bar at here in San Antonio? All right. The Anchor Bar is uh, 4553 North Loop 1604, and that's Suite 1133. You'll oh. see it out there. Yeah. Best it, wings I've had. Yeah, it was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, we wanted to bring people down and, uh, you know, and, and give back and say thank you for being a member. And uh, here's some free chicken wings. And um, here's some of the stuff that we're doing. And if you want to get involved, um, let us know because we definitely need help. Yeah. And if uh, we've got folks listening that wanted to uh, donate money, being a nonprofit, uh, you guys are buying T-shirts. You said all these different things. So um, are there ways for folks to donate online or do they contact you guys to uh, put a donation there? If they show up at the social, can they drop some in your baseball cap? Absolutely. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay. Yeah. And we so, have a PayPal account and all that stuff too. So yeah, if you want to go ahead and go online and um, reach out to the team there and then they can uh, take your donation to help get the kids, the uh, badges and things that they need to be able to move through the, uh, the education programs. <laughs> uh, Absolutely. Yeah, Cause if you, kids complete the lesson and they're like, where's my pin? And you're like, yeah, we we're out of money this week to buy pins. Yeah. Sorry, little Johnny, <laughs> but you don't get your JavaScript pin. Oh yeah. You're going to have to wait on that one until, uh, the next fundraising drive. So, right. so I know we've been talking about uh, folks that are cybersecurity professionals or expert coders uh, getting involved. That is there opportunity if I just uh, want to help kids succeed in this. Um, I don't happen to know all these things yet myself. Uh, can I help and contribute? Absolutely. So we uh, we gear a curriculum toward kids, so adults pick it up pretty easily. So our our instructor assistants. Oftentimes they don't know, they're not experts in programming or cybersecurity or robotics. They may know just a little bit or know, maybe know nothing at all, but they pick it up as we go through. And then when the kids ask questions, they're like, oh yeah, I understood that. So there you go. Uh, if you're interested in helping out uh, and you uh, like Big Brother, Big Sister, that sort of programs, and you want to give back to uh, getting our kids through to the uh, learn STEM and get educated here, make uh, San Antonio and our country a better place. Uh, you can do that with the MCPA uh, on the 21st. They're going to have a social out at the uh, Anchor Bar up off of 1604. Uh, you can also check out their website, uh, and you'll be able to listen to uh, this program in full uh, online on our website, uh, www.cybertalkradio.com. Uh, on Tuesday, uh, we put up uh, this episode and all episodes the Tuesday after they broadcast uh, here over the weekend. Uh, you can also listen to uh, all of our past programs, uh, including uh, if you're interested in uh, what's going on here in the cyber uh, command out there at the Air Force, where uh, both of these gentlemen serve. Uh, we had on uh, Sherry Hansen, who was uh, the executive director, the highest ranking civilian uh, out there uh, before she headed back uh, to the War College. She's uh, no longer here with us in San Antonio, but uh, wishing her some uh, good luck here. And, uh, and uh, we've also had a uh, Congressman Will Hurd as uh, one of our four congressional members with a computer science degree. So uh, thank you for listening to Cyber Talk Radio.